Okay, now we can start today's class. So I'm gonna exit out of this one. We have that information, so we're good. Um, and now we can actually go on to today's lecture. So today we're talking about both loading data and how to do exploratory data analysis. So, so far, all that we've done when we're loading data is we're relying on data that's already in an R package. So we've been saying data parentheses and calling on flights or penguins or any of those things. But in reality, for your final project and for real life, it's not going to be in an R package, the data that you want to download. So we need to know how to get data into R outside of that. So there's three data files that you'll need to download um, to practice with, basically. So we're going to practice with a CSV, a .dta, which is a stata type file, um, and then a Excel file. So we're going to download those. So you can just click each one of them. And I'm going to do that with you. Uh, wherever I have my things. Classwork. There we go. So I don't have a data folder because I never created one, but I think most people do. And I'm going to save them in here. So I have my avengers.csv. I'm going to download this stata file to the same folder. And then a stake risk survey to another folder. And each of these, you can see the source of where the data is coming from on the um, button next to it. OK, so now that we have those downloaded, you can keep downloading it if you don't have it yet. First, we need to know how to just create a tibble in R. Now, there's two ways to really create a tibble. Um, this is basically creating it from scratch instead of loading data in. If you had very quick data um, that you just wanted to type into R, you could do it this way. Um, you could also use, I mentioned before, there's a data pasta, which is a great name. Basically, this is if you've copied a table from the internet somewhere, you can actually paste it as a triple. Um, that's neither here nor there, though. I just really like that function. So if I want to create a tibble about cats, there's two main ways I can do it. So I can use it using tibble, and I can use it using create it using triple. Very different names. They're going to do the same thing. It just depends on what order you want to put in your rows, columns, and values. Tribble has an R in it because it's row-wise, which I'll explain that as I'm writing it. And tibble is very similar to a um, data frame, the way that you would create the data frame. So to create a tibble, I'm going to call this cats. Tibble. I am going to type Tibble, unsurprisingly. And then here I have to create multiple vectors of information for each column. So I'm going to have a column for coat, I'm going to have a column for weight, and I'm going to have a column for likes string. And for each of these now, I have to say equals and a vector. Remember, this C stands for combine, and this is how you create a vector. So for coat, I'm going to have all of my, my one column, basically, in rows of information here. And these obviously all have to be the same length. So here, I'm going to say one cat is calico, one cat is black, and one cat is tabby. Now you can see I have three rows of information there. So now I have to create a weight variable where one cat will be 1.2, one cat will be four, that's a giant cat. And then one cat will be um, 3.1. So again, we've got three rows of information. And then finally we have likes string and here we, will, can, we can just say like true, true, false. We've got three values here. So I'm going to run that and see that I have a spelling error in tibble. 
and fix that. And now if I want to look at cat's tibble, I can run it and see that we've got a small little tibble here. We've got coat, weight, and like string are the three columns we have with some um, character vectors here for calico tabby, calico black and tabby, different numeric um, vectors for their weights, and then a logical vector for whether or not they like string. Now let's create the same exact thing, but using Tribble. I like Tribble actually a lot better. I always forget how to write it, but I find it a lot more intuitive. Um, so I'm going to now say cats Tribble. And here I'm going to say Tribble. And here's where it gets a little bit like, I don't know, I find it a lot more intuitive, but it takes a minute to get used to. So here, everything we're doing is actually going to look kind of like this. So we're first going to say the three columns we have, and then we're going to say for each row, these are the values. For each row, these are the values. So this is why I say it's row wise, because you're creating it in rows instead of as an entire column. Because you can see if you're creating this, you can easily unaccidentally write the wrong thing in the wrong order because you're not doing it in the right row. So the first thing I need to do is I have to do a tilde here, which means as a function of. We've seen that before when we did facet wrap. And that's just how we call the columns so that it knows that those are the columns. So the first column we're going to have is coat. The second column we're going to have is weight. And the third column we're going to have is likes string. And here we do a comma and we do a line break. So these all have commas after them. And the only reason R understands, well, the only reason Tribble understands why now we're going to go on and making rows is because they don't have the tilde in front of them. So it understands that, okay, we have three columns and now everything is going to wrap um, every third thing. So the first one we had was Calico, which was a 2.1, or sorry, 1.2 kilogram, I don't know, Calico cat who liked string. The second one we have is a black cat who weighs four and also likes string. And then finally, we have a tabby cat who weighs 3.1, who does not like string. And that's the end of it. So hopefully everyone can see the difference between these two if we're making a tibble from scratch. This way, we're doing it by column. And so we're going from the top to the bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. And here we're going row wise, where we're saying, here's the columns and we're going by each row. I, again, I find Tribble a lot more intuitive, but this should be Tribble. So I'm gonna run that and then look at it. And it looks exactly the same. And I can prove that it's exactly the same by saying cats Tibble equals cats Tribble. And you can see there's a true in each um, cell because each cell is equivalent. And I successfully wrote them equivalently. So those are two ways to make your own tibbles or data frames. Um, they're equivalent. It matters how you like to write them best. But in practice, every time I need to make a data from, from scratch, I have to look it up because I do it so infrequently. But you kind of have to understand the logic of how it's created. So now we can actually start working on reading in data frames. So um, the most common way you'll do this is using a .csv file. .csv stands for common, comma separated values. And comma separated values are extremely common. You can also have tab separated values, which are, I would say are less column, common, but they're both pretty universal across the world and are the most portable data format because basically whatever's in the column, it's gonna have a comma at the end of it. Um, and so this is the most common way to read in a um, new data set. So let's call this loading.csv. So there's a base R way to do this. I know some people have a little bit of R experience in their background. We're not using the base R way. The base R way uses a period, we're gonna use an underscore. So here I'm gonna write, not read.csv, yes, read underscore CSV. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I'm only mentioning this because I have a feeling on like three homeworks, I'm gonna see it done the wrong way. And so I'm trying to warn you. We're using read underscore CSV because it's a lot faster. I think it's like 10 times faster. And there's some default settings that 
read it more correctly. And basically, anytime you have a character vector, it's not going to try to force it into a factor. There's a lot of things, but we're using read underscore CSV, period. <laughs> so let's read in this Avengers data set that we have. So let me look in my file structure. I did not save the Avengers data set in the right space. So hold on, I have to move it. Move. I saved it in images. There we go. So now it's going to be saved under data. So now I can say read underscore CSV. And the first thing you can see it's asking for is the file name. So I can say file equals. And then I'm trying to think of the default of how it's going to work here. It's going to be different than when ugh, our markdown is such a pain. It's so useful, but sometimes it can be a pain. I'm going to use the here function. <laughs> um, about two thirds of you know what that is. If you don't, um, I think you'll be able to catch up pretty quickly. This is basically a way to make our paths a lot easier. Um, and I regret not just teaching it in the very beginning. So here is basically going to go to our, our project and then build up from there. And so I don't have to worry about where my R Markdown file is. I can do it that way. And I'm not positive that I understand my data structure as is. So here I'm going to say data. So go to the data folder and then go to the file. Um, if you don't have the here, here package, by the way, you have to download it. And that's what this is doing is it's saying from the here package, use this function. Um, go to the data, data folder and go to avengers.csv. So I can run that, see if I get an error. I did not, which means my path was correct. And so we can see here, we've got column specification. It lets us know that there's something called appearances that it interpreted as a, um, a numeric double type, same with year and same with years since joining. And then the rest of them, you can see by default are character columns. So let's take a glimpse at this, which was one of my favorite data exploration commands. We can see We've got 21 columns, 173 rows of Avenger characters from the comics and movies. And we've got a lot of NA values because some people did not return five times after death. Um, and we've got different notes that are characters. That looks pretty cool. Um, if I want to see exactly how each column was read in, I can say spec Avengers. I should just move my console over here so I have to stop moving it back and forth. Maybe I'll do that for next class. Um, we've got URL, which is a character. We've got all of these different things and it lets us know how it was read in. If it read something wrong, read CSV works by reading the first thousand rows and doing a very educated guess on what type of column it is. But if you have NAs in the first thousand, it's gonna have a hard time guessing what type of column that is. So if that happens and you have a wrong guess, which we don't have here, depends on your mood, but I think this is fine for my purposes, you could say column call types. And here's where you have to define what each type of column is that you want to be read. I'm not gonna do that now. I'm just letting you know it's an option. 80% of the time it's gonna be fine. And then there's all these like special cases where you might have to go into the settings of read CSV to get it to do something more explicit that you want it to be, to be done. So as I said, CSV is very common for most file types across systems. It's a very common export format because it's very clean. You could, however, receive data from Stata. Um, Stata is a statistical programming language, just like SPSS, just like SAS. Um, I'm just using Stata as an example here. But to load any of those data types from these proprietary expensive softwares that none of us want to pay for. Um, so if I want to use someone's SATA data without having to pay for SATA to open it, I can open it in R. So to do that, we're going to use a package called Haven. Haven came downloaded with the Tidyverse, but it doesn't come loaded because you're not using it all the time. So we have to first load Haven. And then we're going to, the name of the file is CRF33. This is just a practice data set from Stata. 
and we're going to say read underscore DTA. I have a question in the chat. There's no package called here. Okay, so Ash, you'll have to download using install.packages, download the package called here. You could also here just do file equals data backslash Avengers. It probably works for you. You just have to make it relative to your own file structure. Okay. Oh, another chat. Okay, cool. Um, so in this case, my data is in the same spot. So let me actually just copy and paste this. Oh, that's too many parentheses. Um, and see if I can get it to load without having to do here. So my data is called crf33.dta. I actually might need backslashes in front of those. It's also finicky. So I did not actually run my library haven command. So I'm going to run library haven. And I'm going to try to load in this data set. Okay, it did not like that. Let's see. Okay, there we go. It's always so finicky. Maybe a person from computer science can help me there. I always just try multiple things and it depends so much on what works. Um, just one quick question. Yes. Why do you have to refer to data if you're already like inside Stat so for technically, four twelve classwork or whatever. Um, oh, what is, if I just click here and click go to working directory, there's also a command you can do in your console to do that. My actual working directory is here, and my data is saved in the data folder. So if I say read the CRF, it's going to say that doesn't exist. So I have to tell it to go into data and then read it. Just because okay, so, I mean, so it doesn't have the capacity like to go inside a folder and read it, even though that's your working directory. It does by me telling it which folder. I believe. I think the here command has something like that. No, and it's because it's looking for an exact file path. You can see like that. Okay. That doesn't exist, and so there is something you can do, making it kind of recursive, which may be what you're asking. I just don't think that it's very common because you want to be explicit on where your stuff is. Okay, so now we've loaded this CRF data. Let me just run it one more time because I think I did. Yep. And now I can do another glimpse here at CRF 33. And this looks normal, but if you notice here, it looks a little less clean than this does. And that's because Stata, SPSS, and SAS all use something called label data, meaning they have A, B, C, and then they have a thing after it that says, this is what this column means, or the question from the survey, or whatever it is. And it lets you know it came from this data format, what it was read in as, that's just something you have to live with. Um, there's ways to remove it. This isn't super common. I don't, I don't think many people will be reading in these sorts of data sets, but if you are, here's a quick, here's how you do it. Um, you can also see those by saying structure. Um, I know some people already knew this command coming in. This is just another way to summarize the data. It looks almost the same as this. And you can see these attributes. Okay, finally, we'll learn how to read Excel data, but huge like asterisks here. You have to make sure your Excel data is clean, meaning it has to look kind of like a .csv. It has to be in a tabular format with matching rows and columns that are square. If you have something in row 35 column AM, like way off, it's going to mess everything up. If you have something in the second sheet, you can say which sheet you want to go to. But often Excel is worked in a non-tabular format. So often Excel, you're like doing maybe some financial analysis and you're like, okay, here's all these. And then here's my second, like people use Excel, not in a tidy way. And so you have to make sure your data is tidy before you bring it in. In our case, um, our stake risk survey is clean. It's a square data, meaning we've got the same number of rows or we've got matching rows for every column. Everything's in the top left corner of the Excel. Um, so now we can, read Excel. I believe this also comes downloaded with Tidyverse. If it doesn't, you'll have to download install packages.readexcel. 
Um, but we, no matter what, we have to load it into our library. And it's called read Excel. So I'm going to load the stake file using the command read read Excel. In this package, there's a lot of like read. Sorry, there's a lot of read. Where are they? If you ever want to know what functions come from what packages, you could always just type the name of the package. So there's read XLS, read XLSX, but the read Excel is like the universal version of it. And here, instead of saying file, you have to say path. We love consistency in our programming. <laughs> and I can say data backslash stake risk survey. And I can load that and it did work, which is nice. And I could do a glimpse of stake. So you can see here, I've got 15 columns. Here's their names and types. Almost everything was loaded in as character. We may not want that. So we have to keep an eye out. Um, like these are yes, no's. We may want that to be true, false. Those are things that you have to choose for yourself. Um, and like, this is categorical. You may want to change that into a factor. Those are things that you have to decide as you're loading in data. But at this point, we've learned three different ways to load in data. We've learned the CSV, which is really what we want to be doing most of the time. Um, if you don't have something in a CSV or TSV format, TSV is the exact same. It just has a T instead of a C. Um, you can use something like Read Excel or Haven. You can always Google. There's ways to get in all of these types of data into R, but you just have to find the way. I can't cover all of them, but this covers, I would say, a large chunk of them. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because on Thursday in our lab, you will have done for your homework some exploration on some data that you might want to use for your final project. I know it's February and your final project's in April, but we have to start thinking about that. So um, you actually, let me pull up your readings for the week and I'll show you. I think it's week five. Let's see. I have another question. Yes. Um, why won't you use like read CSV for an Excel file? Um, if you've saved an Excel file as a .CSV, you can use this. But CSV will not read Excel because Microsoft likes to put proprietary like encoding around things. And so if you try to read CSV on an Excel file, it won't know how to read it because there's all this, just like Microsoft Word can't be read with a um, notepad reader. There's all of these like weird things that they embed that makes it so it's not plain text. So CSV is like a plain text version of Microsoft Word. Perfect. Okay. Kelsey. Yes. Sorry if you've already answered this. Is it okay to always use the here function because yeah. it's easier? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a lot of instructors will tell you just like use here. And that's because it's going to by fault by default go to your R project. And so no matter where you are, it's gonna go there and you can build up from there to find your things. Otherwise, let's say I was like three folders down into my, I don't know, my images technically in my working directory, I'd have to use the dot, dot, dash, dot, 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 dot. Like it can just get really messy and this is quite clean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, yes. one more thing. I, I don't know what's up with my R today, but- um, That's my, That was reason, my mood yesterday. <laughs> it kept crashing. For, for some reason, um, even after doing uh, the CRF free free and mm -hmm. the Avengers data, data sets using glimpse for some reason it's not working for um, the stake survey. Did the stake were you able to load it incorrectly? Like, can you see it in your environment? Yeah. If you double click on it, will you, will it show up as the view? That's so weird. I would say you probably just have a spelling error, <laughs> or you're missing a parenthesis. Like all of these tiny little bugs. Glimpse should work because Glimpse will work on both data frames and tibbles. It should work on everything. That's a um, tabular data structure. Okay, this is your homework. As you can, you can all see it. All right, on my screen, you don't see R. Good. Um, your homework will be to watch this quick five-minute video on why good data sets are fun and powerful and useful for learning, which I think is 
good inspiration because he also talks about a few good data sets. Um, you'll go through the exploratory data analysis chapter of the textbook. And then your job is to explore some of these different data archives that have cool data sets. Um, and then you're supposed to come to the lab on Thursday with two data sets that you're like, oh, this would be really cool to work with for my final project. It can be related to your field. It can be, it doesn't have to be from any of these three resources if you find data from somewhere else. But I do recommend that it's fun. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have to be like about Star Wars by fun. I just mean something that interests you and will could interest other people in your group because we're gonna be basically doing data speed dating on Thursday. We're gonna ex do a little bit of exploratory data analysis with a bunch of different people on these two data sets that you've brought in. So again, this is not binding. This is not the data set you have to use for your final project because obviously if everyone's bringing two data sets in and we have like four different groups, how would that work? But this is to like get you looking at data, get you showing your data up to other people and finding things that interest you. That's a preview because now we actually have to talk about what exploratory data analysis is. You know, when you bring in a new data set, do you ju just do glimpse and take everything at face value? Or what else can you do with it? So um, this is why we need to do exploratory data analysis. So once basically you've loaded your data in, you've checked it, make sure it's consistent, make sure the column types are right, you wanna do some exploratory data analysis because there are often hidden relationships in your data. There's questions that you already have um, coming in, but there might be other things that are there that you wanna bring in. You might realize in this that you really wanna bring in, I don't know, county GDP, but you didn't, and so now you want to add that on. These are all things that you do when you get to know your data. A huge proportion of data science is, ex is spent just exploring your data. So there's some general strategies you can do here. These are all on the lecture, so you don't have to write them down, but you can plot the distribution of every variable. Look for like, is this a normal distribution? Is this abnormal? What does this distribution look like? What is the bivariate distribution of each of these variables? So if I plot one on the X, one on the Y, you know, if they're both continuous, what does that look like? Is there a relationship between different categorical variables and continuous variables? Um, looking at summary statistics, how does the mean standard deviation change when I look across these different variables? What do the outlier patterns look like? Do I have a bunch of outliers? Do I have a bunch of NA patterning, um, meaning a bunch of people refuse to answer race on this question? What does that mean? for my analysis that I might be wanting to conduct. Um, and it's really about curiosity here. You're really bringing in the questions you already had about your data. You're making hypotheses. You're looking quickly at different things. You don't need to do big statistical tests, but you're looking at what are interesting questions that are here? What are questions that you could be asking and getting to know your data? So one thing that I like to do, one of the first things when I'm working with a new data set is use something called skimmer. So if you know the word skimming, it usually means when you're reading a book and you just kind of go quickly to get the main idea, you're not reading for depth or clarity, and that's what skimmer can do. So this, no surprise, is another package, but it's just a package that I really enjoy using. So everyone will have to install packages, skimmer. If you never use this, that's fine, but I find it quite useful. And when I learned about it, I was very happy with it. So library, I'm very bad at spelling today, skimmer. And then here I can say skim. Um, you can alternatively also not do library and just say skimmer. That's often what I do because it's a function you might only use once. Um, and I can skim the Avengers. So if I say skimmer Avengers, you'll see I get a lot of printout at the bottom here. This is very valuable because it says the name of the data set, the number of rows, number of columns. That's something we've seen a lot of different ways. But it also tells me how many of these columns were character versus numeric. And then what do all of these character vectors look like? So for the URL column, I'm going to have a unique URL for each row. So I have 173 unique URL characters. But gender, I have two unique values. So I can see that that could be easily changed into a um, factor, which is what we usually use for um, categorical variables. Um, honorary, I don't even know what that is, but I also don't know what probationary intro is. I don't know. This is about the Avengers. I don't know that much about them. Whether they're a 
uh, oh, there, whether they're current, um, currently in the Marvel universe or not. And then for numeric variables, what I really like is it gives you an automatic printout of their histogram. So you can see how skewed they are. All of these are highly skewed. Um, and so that means we're very zero inflated or one inflated. The year, I'm wondering why there's all this dead space here. There must be one Marvel character from, yeah, okay. One, there's one Avenger character from 1900 and the rest are really around like 1980, 1990. So we have a huge um, left tail here. That's really useful. What's also cool though, is we can run this through a group by. So I'm just, oh, go up here. I can call in like the diamonds data set that we worked with before and I can group by cut. And then I can run skim. And my typing is all over the place today. So now if I run this while I do skim, which let me make it so you can still read that if you're still typing. <laughs> uh, there we go. So if I run, if I do a group by before I do skimmer, you can see that now instead of just having each of, okay, so here we've got factor. Um, instead of having each row, each column as its own row here, we've got the cut across each of these other variables. So what does this look like? What does the distribution across these different values look like? This can be very useful as you're trying to get to know your data set, as well as when we're doing the numeric, it's going to break it up by all of these different cut values for each of these. So you can see, does the distribution change when I'm looking at the different cuts? So if cut was a vari variable you were really interested in and breaking down the diamonds data set, you could see that there are a little bit, little changes here and there between um, like the distribution here. These histograms are very different. So whatever Z was, I don't remember. Um, it does vary by cut. That's pretty useful information. A another, this is, these are all types of automated exploratory data analysis. So another automated exploratory data analysis is VizDAT. Um, you can see the words visualize data here. And this one's really useful if you're looking for um, patterns in your variable types in your and in your missingness especially. So no surprise here that this is also a package you would need to install. These are just different tools that people have made along the way. Um, is that so library is that and now here I can look at for instance the command would be viz underscore dat stake for instance so if I run that I believe in my bottom right I'm going to get a printout of here are the types of columns versus their NAs across the data set. So there's a few people who answered like nothing, which is important to know if they've answered so little of the survey or the even valid survey respondents. These are things that you might be thinking of if you're working with survey data. Um, I can also visualize the Avengers. So you can see this looks a little, little bit differently because most of these are NAs because as he said, most characters haven't died and returned like five times. Um, and you can get to know what are the data types here. As I said though, this is often most useful when I'm looking for missingness. So I can do this miss as another thing and I can say Avengers and then I can actually cluster this within my command. So it can, um, instead of by the default ordering, it's going to order this by, you know, these ones are less missing, these ones are more missing. And it's gonna give a sort of logical ordering here. Um, I can even run this on, there's a, a data set that came with this called air quality, which helps a little bit too. Mm, like that. There we go. So you can see that while most things aren't missing, there is some clustering to these missing. These are things that you might be looking at when you're exploring, exploring your data. 
And then finally, there's one called this compare. So if you're working with two data sets that you think are the same, let's say you read one in a CSV and you read one in as Excel, if you think they're the same, you can do this compare and make sure they're the same. So like the cats we created earlier, cats triple, are they the same? Yes, they are the same. They're all orange, which means same here. So something interesting to also focus on is that EDA is really important because sometimes if you just look at summary statistics, like if you just look at the mean and the standard deviation, for instance, here, all four of these plots have the exact same mean and standard deviation. So if you only look at the mean and the standard deviation, you wouldn't get the fact that this is clearly an outlier. You should maybe want to drop that outlier. Um, here, the mean and standard deviation does not does not comprehend the nonlinearity of your data, um, as well as this might be an outlier too. So these are all things you want to look at, and you might want to visualize your different columns because um, you might have some really interesting patterns in your data that you're not revealing here. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you another example of this right now. You don't necessarily have to follow along here because you have to download another package, but it's called Datasaurus. And this is called the Datasaurus Dozen, which is uh, our version of the plot I just showed you. So if I load the Datasaurus dataset, which is library Datasaurus, and I bring in the Datasaurus Dozen, I can show you if I group by the data set, which I've already looked at this. I'm just going through this quickly just to give you a um, exact idea of this. I'm not teaching you per se right now. Um, if I take the mean of x equals mean of x, the mean of y equals mean of y, the standard deviation of x. standard deviation of y. This is just a lot of typing. I should have just copied and pasted this. But um, and then the correlation of x and okay. So this is just getting the mean of the x column, the mean of the y column, standard deviation of x column, standard deviation of y column, and the correlation of the x y column. If I what did I do? There we go. I have an extra underscore. Could not summarize problem with summarize input core xy. Could not function to core. It's because I have an extra r. I always do that. Okay, there we go. So with this data set, which I'm going to visualize for you in just a second, all of the mean of x is the same. All of the mean of y is the same. All of the standard deviation of x is the same. Standard deviation of y is the same. And the correlation is quite similar, um, very similar. If I visualize this, you'll see that these are highly different data sets. So I'm actually just going to paste this because I know we don't have that much time left in class. But we've got ggplot of the data source dozen, x equals x, y equals y, color equals data set. And we're going to facet by data set. So if I zoom in here, hopefully everyone can see this decently. These are highly different data sets, but they all have the same mean, same standard deviation, and almost the same correlation. We've even got a dinosaur here, a star, X-shape, V-line, slant down, but they have the same summary statistics. So you need to do exploratory data analysis, especially when it comes to um, visualizing your data. And that's why we learned ggplot so early on is because you might want to look at these sorts of things because this is really important. This has a lot of impact on, um, you know, one day you'll be running regressions or you already are. The normality of some of your um, parameters have an impact on the assumptions you're able to make and the um, the conclusions you're able to make from your regression analyses. This is important. So visualize your data. That's basically the end of that.
Um, so finally now, before we end, I'm just gonna show you how to export your data. So let's say for instance, I've taken my stake data and I've filtered it where I wanted the, there's a column called hypothetical scenario. Let's say I wanted that to be equal to lottery B. Write a header here, export. And then I selected only the first 10, five columns. I don't know, I'm just doing this randomly. So in select, you can also select by column numbers, which some people figured out in their homeworks. Um, let's say I did that. This is my due data set. I want to save this. I've done some, like when we discovered our outliers, let's say I wanted to save that. So I can call this stake small. And I save this as stake small. Well, now we have a, a new object called stake small here. We usually want to just recreate it based on the commands here, but let's say the commands take an hour to run. That's completely possible. You often want to export your um, data frame in some way. So to export, before we read CSV, now we want to write CSV. So we can write CSV and then we, if we see here, we say the name of the file. Well, no, first we have to say what we want to save. <laughs> so we want to save stake small. And then we give it the file path of where we want it to save to. So in many cases in your file structure, you have a data structure and then you have a data output structure. Maybe this is something that you want to make very pretty in Microsoft PowerPoint. I don't know. Um, so I'm just going to save it back to the data folder because I don't have a data output folder, but you might want one. Um, so I'm going to call it data backslash. That means save it into that folder and call it, let's just call it stake small. And no matter what it was when it came in, I can always save it as a CSV. So I might also, because I read in stake from an XLS file, maybe now I'm just saving it as a CSV to get it out of XLS file. So I can save it. And then all I have to do is run that line. And now in my data, I have a stake small CSV. Very common thing to do. Um, if, for instance, you have an abnormal data structure, so everything I have here are tibbles or are, no, they're all tibbles. But let's say I had a very complicated object after I ran some machine learning, or I have a ggplot file that I wanted to save. All of these different things, you can actually save those too. You save them as a .rds file. So saving R files. If you're saving normal table data, save it as a CSV. But again, sometimes I've run some fancy machine learning. It took two hours to run. I don't want to recreate that from scratch. I can save the output of that um, to a .rds file. So here I can say, it's not right, it's a different one. It's save RDS. And it's gotten different because you can see it comes from base, which is base R. But I want to save stake small to the file equals, I'll just copy and paste this. And then the big thing is here, it's not a, it's not a CSV now, it's in RDS which usually is written like that with a capital R and lowercase ds. So now if I open this up, it's going to open up very cleanly here. Is it super useful in this context? No, but you might eventually need to save an R, um, R file as a output. Most of the time, though, stick to CSV. OK. Um, I'm really impressed that I finished class on time. Uh, I know that was rushed. There's a lot in the textbook on exploring exploratory data analysis that I didn't touch on because it's so well done in the textbook. Um, please do read it because it goes into a lot of more of the statistical perspective, I guess you could say, of exploratory data analysis, and I'm not going to cover it, and you need to know it. So please do read it and please do watch the video and then explore some um, interesting data sets that you would like to use for your final project. Um, 
I find that part very fun. One of the resources you will be, actually I can stop sharing my screen. Um, one of the resources that is on there is called hashtag tidy Tuesday. It's a huge R community that every Tuesday they release a new data set and like a thousand or so people work on that data set, usually doing visualization, but sometimes doing um, other statistical analyses on that data set. It's real data coming from somewhere in the real world. They constantly are using different things. Um, big ones they've done are like common dog names in New York, like really random, but always interesting. So you're gonna need to read through like, what are some different ones there? Are there any ones that pique your interest? I think last week they did um, like, disparities in wealth across races historically, which is really interesting. Really good visualizations come from that. If you want to just get inspired by it, you can on Twitter do hashtag tidy Tuesday. That's mostly where people display their work. Um, another one is from the data is plural archive, which has some really interesting data sets on there. Kaggle is a very common one that a lot of people use. Um, okay, I do have a private chat that I need to read. Um, Kaggle you'll hear a lot about in a lot of classes. I find their data a little bit boring, but in the video that you'll watch, it's only five minutes, it's completely worth watching. That person does cover a few other sources for data. So bring at least two that you would like to use and you may wanna practice loading it before class because you will be loading it during class and working with it then. All right, I hope you're all excited because that's a different type of lab than we've been doing, but it's fun. So I will see you all Thursday. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kelsey. I again. I. <laughs> I'm. I don't know what's happening with it, but I was wondering if you had any advice. Um, yeah, you can share your screen. Yeah, I will. Uh, Wait, let me stop recording. <laughs>